Welcome to review lecture number three. This is part two of our review of descriptive statistics. I'm Chris Mack, the professor for this online review course of undergraduate probability and statistics. Last time, we talked about the definition of descriptive statistics. This is a summary of a large set of data with just a few numbers. Sometimes we can summarize with a graph, but usually what we're trying to do with our descriptive statistics is to summarize the basic tendencies of the data with just a few numbers. We apply mainly descriptive statistics to univariate data, uh, although later on we'll talk about correlation and the correlation coefficient, which is a descriptive statistic for bivariate or multivariate data. The statistics that we use depend upon the measurement scale. We talked about nominal and ordinal scales as a type of categorical data, and interval and ratio scales as a type of quantitative data, and we use different statistics depending on the scale. One of the things we often did, and I'm going to refer mainly to quantitative data here, either interval or ratio scales, one of the things we generally tend to do is plot the data, if we have enough data points, with a histogram. Here's an example we showed last lecture. So if you see a shape of a histogram, uh, a set of data plotted like this, what kind of things do you want to know about it? Well, we can basically describe the three things we want to know as the shape, the central tendency, and the spread of the data. So the shape is a qualitative description of the kind of shape we see. A measure of central tendency is where the middle of this set of data is. And then the spread is how spread out are the data about this measure of central tendency. These are the three most important ways in which we describe uh, statistical data. However, uh, there are other measures. There's lots of other measures, actually. Uh, just most of the time, these three will be sufficient. Uh, for example, we might want to know the skew, which is a measure of how asymmetric the distribution is. Now, when we aggregate data into only looking at a few summary statistics, a summary statistics, there are some important points of the data that can be hidden. Uh, in particular, we might have some really interesting things going on in the tails of this distribution, say way out here, that might be hidden if we just concentrate on the middle part. Um, if we don't plot the data and only look at mean and standard deviation, for example, measure of central, ten central, central tendency and a measure of spread, we can also miss out. So it is almost always very valuable to plot the data as a histogram, as long as you have enough data points to make that worthwhile. And so the first thing you want to look for is the distribution shape. We generally think or assume or hope that our data will come back as being symmetrical and unimodal, um, a Gaussian distribution or something like this. We'll talk more about distributions more rigorously later, but generally something that looks like a bell curve is what we expect, but we don't always get that. If we had a symmetrical but bimodal distribution, shown here in the middle, then uh, that's a very different situation, and uh, we might treat that data very differently than we do if we realize that we had a unimodal distribution. Likewise, we can see from the graph uh, on the right, that we have skewed data. This is an asymmetric distribution. And again, if we notice that we have skewed da data, we might treat the data a little bit differently. We might measure the skew or, or use that information in some way. So plotting the data is useful. To plot the data and get anything out of it, though, you need a large number of data points. If I had 20 data points or 30 data points, it's often very hard to see what's going on with a histogram plot. So besides the shape, the next thing we want to discuss is a measure of central tendency. There are many measures of central tendency, but by far the most common is the mean, also called the average or the arithmetic mean. It's simply the sum of all the data points divided by the number of data points. 
The median, the other very common measure of central tendency, is the middle point. In other words, we rank order all the data from highest to lowest. We pick out the middle value, if we have an odd number of values, and that's our median. If we have an even number of values, then we take the two middle values and we average them. The mode is the most frequent data value. Modes are, for experimental data are almost only used for the case of uh, um, categorical data. It doesn't make much sense for most data sets to, to discuss the mode for quantitative data. We sometimes use the mode when we use analytic calculations or analytic descriptions of a distribution. And we'll talk about that when we get into probability in a few lectures. Now, another important measure of central tendency that is uh, used less frequently than it probably should co is, is called the trimmed mean. Uh, the 10% trimmed mean is a very common example. What do you do? You rank order the data like you're going to calculate the median. But then you throw away the 10% of the data that has the largest values and the 10% of the data with the smallest values. Now you're left with the middle 80%. From the middle 80%, you simply calculate the mean, just as you would before. What's the value of a trimmed mean versus just using the mean? After all, we're throwing away 20% of our data points. We spend a lot of time and energy and money to collect those data points. Why would we throw them away? Well, every now and then you get a bad data point. One bad data point can completely destroy a mean calculation. If I have one data point that's far, far away from all the others in the middle, then my mean will get shifted a long ways, influenced almost entirely by that one bad data point. Uh, the trimmed mean will throw that data point away. In fact, you can have up to 20% of your data being quote unquote bad data. Something happened to it that resulted in a, a value that is completely out of whack from what you expected or what the rest of the data uh, shows you. We call measures that are insensitive to bad data robust statistics. So the 10% trimmed mean is a robust measure of central tendency. I can have up to 20% bad data points and I still get a good number. The mean is non-robust, uh, one dead, completely non-robust, one bad data point and it's, it's, you have to throw it away. Median is a very robust. You have to have a, a lot of data, bad data points before the median starts uh, becoming way off. These measures of central tendency will all line up if I have a perfectly symmetrical data set. But if I have an asymmetrical data set, like this graph shows, then the mode, the median, and the mean will all be different. For that reason, Comparing measures of central tendency will tell us something about these asymmetries. If we see the mean and the median significantly different from each other, that is a very good indication that uh, we've got uh, an asymmetric data set, a data set with skew. So we can, if we are just looking at some simple metrics, uh, uh, central tendency spread uh, to describe our data set, it's sometimes useful to calculate more than one measure of central tendency, like the mean and the median, and compare them. Now, besides the measure of central tendency, we need a measure of spread. The simplest measure of spread is the range, the max value in the data set minus the min value. Well, this is not a very good measure. It's a very unstable measure. You collect a data set of, say, 100 data points, and how many numbers do you use to calculate the range? Only two. Right? You completely ignore the other 98 measurements. Uh, the result is a measure that is very sensitive to, obviously, just two data points. And random variation in those two data points will be large, and so random variation in the range will be large as well. A much more stable measure is the interquartile range. Here we're going to calculate the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile of the data. Now an easy way to think of doing this is to take your data and split it in half. Right, if you have an even number of data points, it's easy. Just divide the data in half after you rank order it. Then in the bottom half, you find the median 
that becomes your 25th percentile. In the upper half, you find the median, and that becomes the 75th percentile. Now, if you happen to have an odd number of data points, you simply take the middle data point and include it in both halves, and then go on. Once you've got this 25th and 75th percentile values, which we call the lower, lower quartile, Q1, and the upper quartile, Q3, the interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1. This is a, a very nice measure of, of spread. It is stable. Uh, it's robust. Uh, you can have quite a few bad data points, and the IQR still gives us a good statistical measure of spread. There is something called the mean absolute deviation. So we take our data point, subtract off the mean, and then take the absolute value of that deviation. Then we find the average of all the absolute deviations, and that's the mean absolute deviation. But by far, the most common measure of spread used ubiquitously in science and engineering is the standard deviation. So let's talk about the standard deviation. First, uh, we'll talk about its parent uh, value, the variance. The variance is the mean squared deviation from the mean. So I take the data. Every data point is x sub i. So x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, etc. Are, are, are symbols for each data point up to n data points. So from e every value x i, I subtract the mean. Obviously, I have to calculate the mean first. Then I take this deviation and I square it. Then I find the average value of the squared deviations. That's the variance. Well, when I have a sample, I do something a little bit different. I divide instead of by n, like a normal average or mean would be, I divide by n minus 1. n minus 1 is called the degrees of freedom in my data set for the variance calculation. The reason why the degrees of freedom is n minus 1, when in fact I have n data points, is I lose a degree of freedom by calculating the mean. Uh, the mean is not independent of all the data points. Right? The mean depends 100% on all the data points. So by calculating the mean, I have some little correlation between uh, the mean and the individual data points, and that results in a loss of degrees of freedom by 1. Um, so I divide by n minus 1 to get what's called an unbiased estimator for the variance. We're going to talk about estimators and bias in estimators a little bit later in this review set of lectures. Uh, for now, we'll just accept the fact that we divide by the degrees of freedom for the sample variance. Now, for a population variance, we don't have this problem. If there are only n data points, and we use all n data points, if there are only n in the entire population, and we use all n, then we will calculate the population variance by dividing by n instead of n minus 1. Now, that rarely happens. We hardly ever have a population at our disposal. Instead, we always have a sample. So we'll use the sample variance for our calculations. Now, what is the standard deviation? Standard deviations is nothing more than the square root of the variance. We often use the symbol s for standard deviation, and the variance is s squared. Another way in which we use descriptive statistics is summarizing using a group of numbers. A very common set of summary statistics is called the five number summary. The max the upper quartile, median, the lower quartile, and the minimum. Those five numbers tell us a lot about the data. We can also use the median, mean and standard deviations or multiples of the standard deviation, uh, but generally the five number summary that is most commonly used are these five numbers. Once we have these five numbers, we will list them in a table or maybe and, we'll graph them. And the way we display graphically the five number summary is with the box and whiskers plot. Box, box and whiskers plot. I take a box, 
I make the bottom of the, of the box equal to the lower quartile, Q1. I make the top of the box, the upper quartile, Q3. And I make, uh, draw a line through the middle of the box, not the middle, rather. I, I draw a line where the median exists, somewhere in the box, but it may not be exactly the middle. Then I draw the whiskers. Whiskers are lines that end at the max and a line below that ends at the min. This graphical display of the five number summary makes for very quick and easy comparisons of different data sets. For example, here are uh, five, uh, four tests, test A, B, C, and D, that were done on a particular set of data. And I could take every data set and summarize that data set with the five number summary. If I plotted that five number summary with a box and whiskers plot, I can now very quickly compare and see what's going on. All right, so I see that the median is, is moving around a little bit. The spread is moving a bit. In particular, the interquartile range uh, of test B is the widest. Test A is about the same. Um, but test C and test D are significantly smaller in the interquartile range. So maybe I'd say that the central tendency is staying about the same, um, but the spread is changing a lot with test C and D compared to test A and B. The box and whisk whiskers plot makes for a very quick comparison uh, in, in different data sets. As practice, you can use the data sets in the lecture two and three uh, Excel spreadsheet that is available on the course website. You can easily calculate some measures of central tendency and some measures of spread. Look at the calculations that I have included in those spreadsheet to learn how to make Excel do those things for you. You can also create a box and whiskers plot for a data set. To do that in Excel is really, really hard. They don't have a built-in box and whiskers function, unfortunately. But you can trick Excel into doing that. Uh, I don't recommend it. Uh, getting a better graphing program to do your box and whiskers plot is much easier to do. Nonetheless, in my spreadsheet, I've created some box and whisker plots that you could use if you wanted to just swap out the data and not have to go through the rigmarole of how to make Excel work at box and whiskers plots. All right, let's review lecture number three, our second part in a two-part series on descriptive uh, statistics. What have we learned? As always, you should be able to quickly and easily answer these questions. If not, go back and review the material. Name four measures of central tendency. Name four measures of spread. And what are the five numbers generally used to make a box and whiskers plot? That is, what are the five numbers in the five number summary? Well, that's our lecture second part on descriptive statistics. We'll see you next time.